Well, here it is. It's the end of the day. I'm tired. My ankles are swollen. I tore three more blisters in my hand. My shoulder hurts. I feel sorry for myself. Gymnastics stopped being fun two hours ago. I want to go home. At this point, many times Tim and I would convince ourselves that we could have happened to us the ultimate gymnastics experience. Whether it's realistic or not doesn't matter. We convince ourselves it is for that moment and say, what if? So I'd look at Tim and say this. Once again, end of the day, just three of us left in the gym. Hey, Tim, let's put some pressure on, okay? I don't care how you feel. Let's just imagine right now it's, it's the Olympics. It's, it's the men's gymnastics team finals. The U.S. team's on their last event of the night. Just happens to be the horizontal bar here. Last two guys up just happen to be Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. We haven't even made the team yet, so what? And here's the catch. This is where I thought it was funny. We start to laugh. I'd say, Tim, let's just imagine that we're neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, reigning world champions. We got to perform our routines right now perfectly to win the Olympic team gold medal. And we'd say, yeah, right. <laughs> we're never going to be neck and neck with those guys. They were first in the world six months earlier in Budapest, where I had my unplanned departure from the horizontal bar I told you about. We were fourth. We didn't even win a medal. It's not going to happen. But what if? Would we be nervous? <laughs> yeah. So I'd walk over, chalk up my hands, close my eyes. In this empty gym, I could vividly imagine that I was instead in the Olympic arena, that there were 15,000 people there, 2 billion watching me live on television. I got one chance to make this performance successfully, or we're going to lose. My heart starts to pound. I'm not tired anymore. Tim's over in the corner of the gym, and he would say something like this. Next up from the United States, Peter Vidmar. Just like the loudspeaker at the Olympics. I'd imagine my name is called and get ready to go. Now, you don't perform when you feel like it in my sport. You perform only when the judge allows you to perform. That's when he pushes a button that makes a green light go on and he raises his hand. And the longer you wait for that green light to go on, clearly the more nervous you're going to get. Tim's over in the corner of the gym in charge of this imaginary green light. And after a long time of saying and doing nothing, trying to throw me off guard by waiting, finally, when he thought I least expected it, he would shout, green light, because I never really had a green light in the gym. He had to say it. I'd imagine the green light goes on. Look at my coach. Imagine my coach is the Olympic judge. He would raise his hand. I'd raise my hand right back, turn, face the bar, grab the bar, and begin my routine. Now, if I fell off the bar there, if I made a mistake there, that ruined my day. I was miserable. Why? Because I placed importance in what I was doing. I didn't say, which I easily could have said at the end of a long, tiring day. I didn't say, so what, Peter? You fell off the high bar. Who cares? It's just a workout. You're tired. Big deal. Just go home. Go home. Just work hard tomorrow. Just work twice as hard tomorrow. It doesn't matter. It's just another day. No. I felt like I lost the whole competition. I placed importance in that routine. I felt like somebody from NBC Sports is going to walk up to me right now and say, well, Peter, you just lost the Olympic Games for your whole country. How do you feel? <laughs> I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> but if I made my routine successfully, I felt great. I'd land my dismount. I'd get all fired up. Oh, yes. Drive home every day after a workout like that one and say, wow, I just won the Olympics today. That was great. I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Got me excited. And we did that for practice, because we knew realistically, and let's be real about this, it's not going to happen. But it's good practice, because it taught us to focus, to be diligent at something. When? When we didn't feel like it. Most important time to put forth effort. That's when you know the most about yourself. Well, a funny thing happened on July 31st, 1984, and I'll finish with this. It was the Olympic Games. It was the men's gymnastics team finals. Uh, the U.S. team was on their last event of the night. Just happened to be the horizontal bar. Last two guys up just happened to be Tim Daggett and... Peter Vidmar, and here's the catch, and all of a sudden we weren't laughing because it really wasn't funny anymore. We were, neck, we were neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, the reigning world champions, and we had to perform our routines perfectly to win the Olympic team gold medal. Well, there are six gymnasts per team, only five scores count, so if one guy makes a mistake, that's okay. Throw out the low score. Count the five best scores. Follow me? Wouldn't that be great in accounting? First guy up, Scott Johnson, was the unheralded hero of our team as our leadoff man got us off to a tremendous start by getting great scores at the beginning from which the rest of the team's scores can build. That is the psychology of that team event. The first guy up is critical of the team score. But after a phenomenal games, Scott lets go of the high bar for his triple backflip dismount. On the third flip, he opens up too soon. He stumbles forward, touches his hands and knees on the ground, makes a mistake, and we thought, oh, no. Chances are 
Next five or teens have to count. The pressure's on. This guy goes up, Jim Hartung, Scott's teammate from the University of Nebraska, the backbone of our team. This guy never makes mistakes. Under all this pressure, he does a great high bar routine, lances dismount, jumps off the podium or platform, which is about the, the same height as this stage, runs around the platform, and then Jim heads straight over to me. Now, I have no idea why he singles me out, but he runs over to me. He's huffing and puffing. He's shouting above the crowd noise, taking off those leather hand guards. He says, hey, Pete, don't worry about it, man. It's not that bad out there, okay? Just relax. Just enjoy yourself. Just have a good time. <clears throat> he was happy because he, he was done. <laughs> Olympics were over for Jim. He scored a 9.8. It's a great score. Bart Connor went up next and scored a 9.9. .9. Mitch Gaylord went up next, did that amazing flip of his, caught it, 9.95. Tim Daggett went up after Mitch, and I wish I had a film to show you that routine. A couple skills he invented. His dismount was a double layout. That's a double back flip with your body straight with a full twist on the second flip, which basically means that you don't see the ground till it hits you. He lands perfectly, and he scores. Yeah, perfect 10. Then it was my turn. <laughs> I told you five out of six scores count, didn't I? How many guys just performed? Five, yeah. Well, let's just take a peek at the first five scores and add them all up, including Scott's routine with that little mistake. Add them all up. Guess what? We just won the Olympic team gold medal. Forget me. We just won the gold medal. You see, Scott's mistake wasn't really that bad. The other four scores were so high, they helped to offset Scott's mistake. Add them all up. That meant that even if the last two performers left from China, Li Ning and Tong Fei, they're two best gymnasts, even if they scored perfect tens on the floor exercise, it's not going to be good enough. So with Tim's perfect ten, we had just secured the USA's first Olympic team gymnastics gold medal, male or female, since the 1904 Olympic Games in St. Louis. That's when wooden club juggling, shot put, and long jump were three of the gymnastics events. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's changed since then. But because it's locked up, this means that Peter Vidmar can fall off the high bar 58 times. We're still going to win the gold medal. And all of my teammates behind me, below the podium, all of them are yet done and celebrating. But none of them, none of the coaches, and no other human being told me that we had just won. So I walk up there, still thinking, oh, this is it, Pete. You don't make this, we lose. Now let me make the picture for you. The crowd's cheering wildly. Tim did a phenomenal job. They have not given him his score yet. I can't go till he gets his score and I get the green light. So I'm pacing back and forth thinking, oh, I got to make this routine. What are they so excited about? All of a sudden, Tim scores a 10. And the crowd goes nuts. They saw Tim's perfect 10, and you couldn't hear yourself think in the arena. The cheers were so loud. I look at Tim's perfect 10, and I said, yay, Tim. <laughs> and then the green light went on. Right before the green light went on, I looked at my coach. This is a man that I've been in the gym with for 12 years. His name is Makoto Sakamoto. He was the USA's top gymnast in the 60s and early 70s. He was there on the floor as the USA assistant coach. He looked up at me, and he gave me a smile. I looked down, and gave him a smile right back. And then he said one thing. They went from here right down to here. He said, okay, Pete, let's go, all right? You know what to do. You've done this a thousand times. Just like the end of every day back at the gym. Let's just do this one more time and let's go home. You're ready. That's right. I'm prepared. I didn't wait till it was too late to figure out how to handle a situation like this. I did this every day at the end of every workout. So all of a sudden, instead of standing in this Olympic arena with the 15,000 people there and the 2 billion on television, in my mind, I put myself where? Back at the UCLA gym at the end of a day with maybe three people left in the gym. And in my mind, when I raised my hand and signaled the Olympic superior judge, always a friendly face, in my mind, I'm signaling my coach just like I used to signal him every day at the end of every workout. Turned, faced the bar, grabbed the bar, began my routine, uh, finished it not quite as easily as I'd like to describe it to you now, but uh, we had a motto that's going to sound simple-minded to you, but it worked for me, and this was it. Practice as if it's competition, but compete as if it's practice. That was our motto. Every day matters. There is no such thing as just another day.